Chapter 8. The Point of the Sword The rest of that night was forever afterward a jumbled memory to Lannis. Under Jamin's direction, he assisted in double-barring the huge castle gates. For a while, he stood guard in the gallery above the gates. Then he was called by Jamin to assist in filling leather bottles with water for those fighting on the upper ridge. When the bottles were full, Lannis and another young soldier were told to carry them to the front. Don't fight unless you are attacked, said Jamin. Your job is to get the water to those who need it. The two young men set out, running swiftly along the path in the darkness. On the way, they passed a number of sentries whom Latta has stationed to prevent the enemy from cutting across the path in the rear of the fighting line. But they encountered none of the evil ones. As they neared the line, an enemy lookout posted in a tall tree far to the left saw them and loosed a flaming dart. But Lannis saw it coming and, flinging up his shield, warded it off without damage. The fighting line was quiet when the lads reached it. The soldiers, grim-faced, were spread out along the edge of the clearing. Lannis was glad to see Robin among them, apparently unhurt. "'How are things going?' Lannis asked in a whisper." We have pushed them back into what is left of the stockade, replied Robin, also whispering. A party is out now under gain, trying to surround the clearing and cut them off. Then we will attack. You haven't been wounded, have you? asked Lannis. No, I'm all right. I was off duty and resting when the enemy came in over the barricade. Before I knew it, they were all around us. Dell and I fought our way back to back until we reached the trees here, where the rest of the detachment joined us, and we stopped them. I wish I could stay up here with you, said Lannis, but I must go back after more water. Lannis made several more trips before the canteens of all the soldiers were replenished. Later he carried a series of messages back and forth between Jamin and Latta, and several from Latta to Gain, who was grouping his forces for an attack on the clearing from the far side. Toward morning, as Lannis was on his way up the path from the castle to the fighting line once again, he heard a shout and a clash of arms, which told him that the counterattack was at last underway. He ran forward and reached the clearing while the battle was raging around the ruins of the stockade. Across the clearing towards the fight he ran, but as he reached the spot, those of the enemy which remained broke ranks and fled across the field into the shadows of the woods. Hiding his disappointment, Lannis quietly sheathed his sword and joined in the work of clearing the wreckage from the inside of the stockade. The next weeks were busy ones. The enemy, perhaps emboldened by his temporary success, was very active and launched a series of attacks against isolated outposts and small parties traveling through the woods. The soldiers of the king rebuilt damaged outposts and strengthened all their defense positions. And a small group under John carried food for many days' journey, slipped away from the castle on a secret mission. In the course of those changes, Lannis found himself assigned largely to duties in and around the castle under Jamin's supervision. He felt the change keenly, for he knew that it was due in part to his failure to do his duty at the outpost. But Lannis had learned a lesson. He would never again have to be told to do his best at whatever he was given to do. Therefore, each time that Jamin assigned him a task, whether it was picking beans in the garden or carrying boxes in or out of the castle storerooms, Lannis did it as thoroughly as though his life depended on it. And he learned a great truth, that if you try to do each job as well as you can, that job becomes interesting even though it was dull before, and thus joy may be found even in unpleasant tasks. Jammin noted Lannis's changed attitude with approval and, as the weeks went by, gave him more and more responsibility. Lannis, on his part, learned to admire Jammin for his careful planning and orderly thinking, and he tried to be like him. All of this, of course, meant that Lannis had little opportunity to join in the skirmishes which occurred outside the castle, though he still attended the daily sword drills in the castle yard. Only twice was he called on to join rescue parties which sallied from the castle to the aid of hard-pressed groups of soldiers. On one of these occasions, he had his first actual fight with one of the enemy. It was at night on the path below the castle. Two of the king's soldiers had been attacked by several of the enemy, and the rescue party had arrived just in time to prevent them from being overcome. Lannis found himself faced by one of the evil ones, a large and ferocious creature with a huge sword. But the lessons he had learned from Gain stood him in good stead, and Lannis was able to beat off his attacks. 
For several minutes they stood toe to toe, exchanging blows. Then the evil one, glancing over his shoulder, saw that his comrades were being driven from the field. After a last murderous thrust at Lannis, he broke away and disappeared into the woods. But though Lannis had won no victory, he was satisfied to realize that he had acquitted himself well and had turned every blow aimed at him by the enemy. And he was pleased to find that, after that encounter, his shield of faith had taken on a slightly brighter luster. Jammin was almost as pleased when Lannis told him about it, and he clapped Lannis heartily on the back. That is a fine beginning, lad, he said. Don't worry about winning great victories, for victories are just the result of aiming each blow well. Lannis grinned and began nailing a lid on a box of dried fruit. My great victory will be long in coming then, he said, for I was able to strike only a few blows. But do you know, Jammin, he continued seriously, my sword was light as a feather and seemed to guide itself. That is a good sign, said Jammin. That only happens when the soldier's arm is practiced and his heart ready for the battle, and when he seeks only the king's glory, not his own. Jammin sat quietly for a moment, watching with thoughtful eyes the swing of Lannis's broad shoulders as he drove the nails home. Then he asked, How much time at swordplay does Gain give you each afternoon? Lannis laid down his hammer to get another strip of wood for the box. About an hour. Part of the time he instructs, and for the rest, I fence with Robin or one of the other men. Gain has been so busy at the outpost lately that his time with us has been limited. Jammin nodded. I am too busy in the castle to get out to sword practice in the afternoons, he said. Usually Lada and I practice together in the mornings, but lately he too has been spending nearly all his time in the field. Would you like to spend half an hour at sword practice with me tomorrow morning? Would he? Lannis's eyes sparkled and he accepted promptly, for among the young soldiers it was understood that Jammin, short and round though he was, was an outstanding swordsman. Some said that he was even better than Lada, but this was disputed. At any rate, Jammin was such a busy person that few of the young men had had opportunity to cross swords with him. Early the next morning, Jammin and Lannis went to a quiet spot in the castle garden, adjusted their helmets and shields, and began sword practice. But Lannis soon found that Jammin's swordplay was not at all the same as Gein's. For Jammin, while lacking Gein's powerful sweeping strokes, handled his sword with incredible speed. He used the point as well as the edge, and his sword point seemed to be everywhere. In one instance, it threatened Lannis's face, in the next, it flicked past the edge of his shield to prick unerringly at a joint in his armor. At the same time, Jammin easily warded off Lannis's counterblows. At the end of thirty minutes, Lannis was exhausted and thoroughly beaten. Jammin lowered his sword and stepped back. I think we've both had enough for this time, he said. Lannis sheathed his sword ruefully. I thought I had begun to learn how to use the sword, he said, but now I find that I know very little about it. Jammin nodded seriously. No one really knows the sword, Lannis. It is greater than any of us, though it was made for our use. The more we practice with it, the more we find there is to learn. Tell me, Jammin, asked Lannis, why is it that your style of swordplay differs so much from Gain's? Gain teaches us to use the edge of the sword while you use more often the point. Both edge and point have value, said Jammin, as they began to walk toward the castle. Gain and Lada are both tall, powerful men, and they love to use the sword in broad, sweeping strokes. Because I have less reach and stature, I practice the use of the point as well as the blade. As the great soldier Paul once said, Every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I sometimes think, though, he continued reflectively, that Lada and Gain lean too much to the use of the edge. Great men of old, like Peter and Paul, won great victories with the edge of the sword, but it is sometimes forgotten that they used the sharp point as well. The sword, after all, is an instrument of great delicacy. It can pierce through the heart as easily as it can slash through the armor of ignorance and unbelief. And in this present day, when so much of our combat is in individual encounters in the close spaces of the woods, where branches and vines obstruct the strokes, I think the point of the sword is often better. Yet there are few who learn to use it well. I should like to learn to use the point, said Lannis. I will teach you, nodded Jammin approvingly. I have been watching your movements as you work about the castle. 
You have the stature and reach to use the edge, and you also have balance and flexibility, which are needed to use the fine point of the sword. If you practice both, you may one day be a better swordsman than I, or Gain, or perhaps even Lada. Who knows? And so, morning after morning, Lannis practiced with Jamin, the use of the sword point. His progress was slow, for the art was difficult and required much study and practice. But gradually, bit by bit, he learned. Each morning, under Jamin's skillful teaching, some new twist or thrust or movement was learned, and those already mastered were practiced until finally the sword began to move easily, naturally, like an extension of his own arm. Try as he might, however, he could not best Jamin, whose sword seemed at times like a ray of light flicking out from behind his shield. But Lannis did find that his morning lessons with Jamin helped him a great deal in the afternoon sword drill which Gain conducted. Many of the young soldiers who before could defeat him with ease found themselves bewildered by this new Lannis, whose sword point flashed past their guard in telling thrusts. He could now cross swords with Robin on even terms, much to the delight of that young man, whose dearest wish was to see Lannis advance in the service of the king. Once, Lannis even slid his sword past Gain's guard, and had Gain not nimbly twisted aside, would have touched him through the center joints of his armor. After the bout, Gain asked sharply, Has Jamin been instructing you? And when Lannis nodded, he said, I thought so. That thrust was like him. Well, there is no finer swordsman in the castle than Jamin, though his method is somewhat different from my own. Learn what you can from him, for it will do you no harm.